Good afternoon, good evening. On behalf of President Stephen Clasco, the Office of Institutional Advancement, and the faculty of the Jefferson College of Nursing, please join us as we begin the Jefferson College of Nursing's 125th celebration. I am Dr. Beth Ann Swan, Dean of the Jefferson College of Nursing, and would like to welcome all of our alumni, faculty, staff, and friends. We have over 150 participants on the call from over 20 states and the District of Columbia. So thank you all for joining us. I'd also like to acknowledge the outstanding work and tireless efforts of the Planning Committee for organizing this magnificent event with special thanks to Christina Gizzo and Rebecca Cheruk, and in addition, special thanks to Michelangelo of the University Archives. And now, it is my honor and privilege to introduce Michelangelo, University Archivist. Thank you, Beth Ann. Um, you, you kind of um, took away my thank you uh, request uh, um, here for a thank you for choosing me to uh, uh, be one of the speakers and for uh, the organization uh, being put, putting this get together together. So let's begin um, with the a title card here. Um, and uh, as you can see on the, the note there, um, there will be time after my presentation for question and answers, so um, uh, just feel free to follow those instructions there. So um, I'd like to begin uh, my talk with an off-quoted definition. History is just one damn thing after another. And although it's of an uncertain origin, the quote is both funny and true in describing bad history telling. So to try and avoid the recitation of long uh, timeline of growth and accomplishments, I thought I would use my 20 minutes to take two or three snapshots in time of critical moments or interesting um, items in the evolution of the Jefferson nursing. Uh, forgive me if I'm saying things that you well know, because I have a feeling you all know this much better than uh, most people. So. Um, our first focus is on the origins, or actually pre-origins, of the Jefferson Training School for Nurses, formally founded in 1891. After doing some original research, looking in trustee minutes and annual reports, etc., uh, you'll be the very first audience to learn the reason why the Jefferson School of Nursing was actually begun. So, ta-da! Um, thank you. <laughs> um, here we see Sari Gamp. Um, most histories of nursing begin with this fictional character um, by Charles Dickens in his novel, Martin Chuzzlewit. She's a nurse, and here we see her on a cigarette card from 1900. This gin-soaked, untrained, illiterate, and boorish lout supposedly represented the typical female nurse prior to Florence Nightingale's training program established in the 1860s. Um, I have a personal confession for years. I used to get irritated by history showing Sari Gamp because this is a fictional person and she, she's negated all the good nursing that real nurses had accomplished in the Victorian age. But later on I'll explain how I came to terms with myself over this and I'm sure you'll be relieved to hear my you know, psychological advancement. But um, uh, in 1824, Jefferson Medical College was created. There were few hospitals in Philadelphia, and those primarily served the indigent sick. The rare minor surgical operation, and remember, this was in the pre-anesthesia days, was conducted at a patient's home. Or if for demonstration purposes, operations were held at a medical amphitheater, like this one here at Jeff, um, almost a century after we'd begun uh, our uh, founding. Um, after which the patient was dumped into a carriage and sent home over our bumpy Belgian block streets. Doctors would advise family members or a nurse for hire to provide recovery assistance. Dr. George McClellan, our founder and first chair of surgery, established a mini hospital. It was actually just a few beds for patient recovery in the attic of the college building. Here medical students, under the guidance of faculty, cared for and learned from their post-operative patients. This was revolutionary pedagogy in America in 1820. 
besides bedside, I'm sorry, bedside nursing experience would be unique to Jefferson until Johns Hopkins in Baltimore established this training requirement for its medical students in the 1890s. It was subsequently promoted as a national standard by educator Abraham Flexner. Jefferson's first hospital of 1877, which you see here, was run by a medical staff and organized with a house steward who was given the responsibility to hire domestics and to appoint a housekeeper to supervise bedding, clothing, furniture, cleaning, and cooking. The house steward's salary was $750 per month, I'm sorry, per year. The first housekeeper, and we know her name, it was uh, Fanny Irwin, received $400 per year. Two male nurses were each paid at $15 a month, and two women nurses received $12 per month. Um, two weeks after this was decided, the Board of Trustees amended this provision to read, and I quote, female nurses, it is asserted, can be obtained from nearby women's hospital to serve without pay. That wishful think thinking seems to have gone nowhere, and the record shows that women were hired, but at the lower rate. This, as you all know, is the famous painting, The Gross Clinic by Thomas Aikens from 1875. Um, it represents a famous scene at Jefferson here um, with Samuel D. Gross, the most famous sir, a doctor in America at that time, uh, surrounded by his um, teaching faculty. The man on the right with the giant mutton chop sideburns is uh, Dr. John Barton. And in 1888, uh, Dr. Barton, at a Jefferson Hospital staff meeting, recommended that he approach the college faculty and the Board of Trustees to gain their interest in establishing a training school for nurses. The following year, Dr. Barton reported that due to a lack of space to house the trainees, the idea was tabled. But in April of 1891, the hospital resident physicians made formal complaints about the quality of the staff nurses directly to the Board of Trustees. A board committee was charged to investigate the complaints and interview the hospital chief and the house staff. A month later, their report stated that there were no problems and it was inappropriate for the residents to approach the board without first addressing concerns to the hospital managers. However, they go on to state, and I quote, at the same time, the committee are of the opinion that there is room for improvement as to the nurses, and nursing in the hospital. In October of 1890, for the first time in the history of this institution, a trained nurse from under the tutelage of Miss Fisher had graduated from the Philadelphia, who had graduated from the Philadelphia Hospital, was placed in the position of chief in the women's department. Upon several evenings in each week, she has given practical talks and instructions to her subordinates." Close quote. The committee also informed the trustees that the faculty of the medical college and the hospital staff, physicians, also provided numerous lectures on wide-ranging subjects. Quote, however, the present system is not all that it should be. They reminded their fellow trustees that Dr. Keene had suggested the establishment of a regular training school months before to raise the discipline and general character of the service. They then provided analysis as to the financial expenditures needed to improve the quality of nursing. What this tells us is that physicians of great renown were educating the trustees again and again as to why Jefferson needed to have professional nurses, both in the hospital and for the good of public health. They concluded, in essence, you get what you pay for. During this busy period in 1891, the board was debating the establishment of a hospital ambulance service at an initial cost of $665. This they did approve. And the possibility of moving the entire college and hospital to, proper, to property down at Broad and Catherine Streets. This they didn't approve. Uh, so they hired an architect to design a new college building uh, at the corner of 10th and Walnut Streets, where clinic, Curtis Clinic is today. Finally, a long and detailed report on nursing was presented and a vote was called to establish a two-year program for a school of training nurses, which passed unanimously. The problem of housing was temporarily resolved by limiting the class at 12 to 15 students. By 1891, the
the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania listed 25 nursing training programs in the state. All were under the aegis of hospitals, but only five of them were connected with medical schools, and Jefferson was one of the premier medical schools in the nation. Besides practical nursing, clinical instruction was supplied by the world-class Jefferson Medical College faculty. In 1965, the U.S. government stressed that training schools for nurses needed to teach, quote, academic medicine in an effort to discontinue the standalone hospital diploma course. Um, but as you can see, if you can see, that's a very tiny image there, at the very outset, Jefferson nurses had the best academic teaching. A rigorous series of lectures for each year were enacted. This list is from 1893. The column on the right um, shows some very sophisticated subjects. Um, and uh, part, part of the way down, you can see that a professor, Clara Marshall, she's actually uh, an MD, she was the dean a Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania is teaching um, a course on uh, basically female sexuality. So I think the male doctors here were a little bit uncomfortable talking to nurses about this kind of thing. Um, the two-year program was extended to three years in 1893. A 30-day probationary period preceded acceptance into Jefferson Nursing School. Good manners, attentiveness, being able to clearly speak, legibly copy doctor's orders and taking good lecture notes were among the absolute requirements. First year students received free room and board in the upper stories of the hospital and were given six dollars per month stipend for books, uniforms, and stationery. A two-week vacation was accorded to them annually, but strict monastic-like rules of discipline ordered their, their remaining 50 weeks with little room for the private life. While the student nurses were learning about the new science of microbiology, they were also cooking patient meals, changing bedding, scrubbing floors, and conducting a myriad of housekeeping chores in addition to the medical needs of patients in the 125-bed hospital. A trained dietitian taught a course titled The Theory and Practice of Cooking. And here they are practicing cooking in a very grim-looking um, uh, hospital kitchen. Our first graduating class photo, 1893-94, depicts six nurses surrounding the directress of nursing, Susan C. Hurl. Miss Hurl was English-born and actually trained under Florence Nightingale before coming to Philadelphia and taking her diploma from the nursing school at Pennsylvania General Hospital. So here's another reason to feel school pride, as you're all descendants from the lady with the lamp. I think that's actually pretty cool. Um, not only was the 19th century the age when the nurse became a trained professional, but according to this Victorian placard, she also became stunningly beautiful. Uh, the serious side of this is that all these early nurses, whether they knew it or not, were proto-feminists. They were advancing the place of educated women as independent workforce professionals who forever changed our society. This is why I no longer hate Charles Dickens and Mrs. Gamp because they're part of that evolutionary arc toward progress. I love this image. It's evidence that Jefferson was an uh, early adopter of technology. We have nurse graduate Pearl Moser as she tries out headphones with two hospital patients. They all listened to a radio broadcast in 1923. The School of Nursing grew um, into the 1920s and 30s to become one of the most respected in the state. The probationary period became four months long, with students required to attend 735 hours of theoretical instruction in 35 subjects. Enrollment burgeoned to about 235 students per year. As 20th century education changed generally, so did the requirements for the nursing profession. State and federal guidelines put an end to hospital-based diploma programs, and the final graduating class of 38 diplomates from Jefferson School of Nursing was in 1982. Over 5,000 nurses had been educated for service throughout the world. Nursing education continued at Jefferson out of the Department of Nursing with special programs awarding BSNs and MSNs. And in 2006, the now named Jefferson College of Nursing was established with its own dean and many advanced degree programs. 
Um, during q and A, I'm going to refer these kinds of questions to Dean Swan, who certainly knows more about this period than I do. So, um, uh, our next snapshot in time will briefly cover uh, the role of nurses in military conflicts. In 1898, the city of Philadelphia sponsored a train to uh, go down to Florida. They hired two Jefferson nurses to travel there and re retrieve 50 wounded American soldiers who had fought in Cuba. Many were treated here at Jefferson Hospital. After the war ended, Jefferson Hospital designated a bed reserved for Spanish-American war veterans free of charge. Jefferson sponsored and staffed a Red Cross field hospital in Nantes, France during the Great War, World War I, for um, more than a year. Both Jefferson doctors and nurses served near the front, providing first-line care for wounded warriors. Uh, one of the three Jefferson nur nurses who died on duty at the 38th Hospital is shown here at the bottom of the page. The Second World War saw military service from both our medical school graduates, shown here in their Army uniforms on Walnut Street, I love that picture, and um, our Jefferson nurses as well. Uh, they served as, joined up as cadets, and they also signed on on the reestablished 38th Red Cross Hospital. This time it was set up under this very flag that we see here in North Africa at Camp Huckstep, just east of Cairo. Here's a, a wonderful picture of the staff posing in front of the Dome of the Rock around 1943 in Jerusalem, nurses down in front. And again, another skanky looking kitchen, this time in the Egyptian desert. That's Mildred Frampling, class of 1942. And we have an unidentified nurse doing lab work in the 38th hospital. Rough conditions, I think. Jane Miller and Doris Bowman, both class of 1942, shown astride camel conveyances at a side trip to the pyramids at Giza. Doris Bowman, as you all know, would serve as the director of the Jefferson School for Nursing from 1958 until its final class in 1982. Imagine being a mother and receiving this telegram in 1942. I'll read it. Mrs. Mary, U Mary L. Ulam, your daughter, Second Lieutenant Madeline L. M. Ulam, Army Nurse Corps, reported a prisoner of war of the Japanese government in the Philippine Islands. Letter follows the Adjutant General. Madeline Ulam was a 1938 graduate who, along with thousands of other Americans, were imprisoned by the Japanese Army in Corregidor. Thirty months later, she was liberated. She's pictured here on the right of this photograph. In 1998, she was awarded an honorary degree here at Jefferson's commencement ceremonies. This publicity shot from a U.S. Army hospital features a Jefferson nurse. Jefferson nurses have served in all the American military conflicts, including the latest in the Iraq War. In a lighter vein, I'm a big believer in marking our passage by ceremony and events. So maybe we can revise some of these unique historic traditions for a 21st century College of Nursing. Or maybe not. Let's see. Um, OK, maybe not. Not the cap and uniform. But as you know, Jefferson did have its own identifying nursing cap. This one came with wingtips that was quite distinct from all the other hospitals. Um, and from about 1910 to the 1970s or maybe 1980s, 70s or 80s, I think you folks can inform me about this, the heavy wool cape in our school colors of black and blue marked the Jefferson nurse at a distance. Um, so alums have donated a few of these to the archives, and they rock, I tell you. Visitors absolutely love them, and they all want to try them on. We don't let them, though. The design of the Jefferson pin with a blue cross and black enamel, again in the school colors, set inside a golden scroll with its legend, was established in 1910. Uh, this is the Thomas Jefferson University version after 1969. And here's an image of some nurses relaxing downtime in Christmas, posing pretty unconvincingly in the common room at the Spruce Street Nurses Residence, 1938. Uh, Christmas time was an important time for uh, nurses back in the last century. Uh, beginning in the 1940s, the Student Nurses Choral Club traditionally caroled in the hospital wards. 
Those candles with open flames, I think, would freak out management today. This would not happen. Um, and here we see them in 1954, caroling outside of the brand new Forderer Pavilion just before the annual Christmas tree lighting. The Women's Board of the hospital hosted an annual tea party for the nursing graduates and their faculty. This photo is from 1961. The Women's Board funded many School of Nursing events and projects throughout the 20th century. A commencement tradition was established in 1928 when Dr. Harvey Ryder, a favorite hospital physician, gave a long stem rose to each graduate. The ceremony of processing under the rose arch to receive the diploma became a tradition soon afterward. And finally, we have, yes, may, maybe a beauty contest is not another one of those traditions we want to reestablish, um, but Miss Jefferson was a source of interest and attention from 1962 to 1970. I read that seats were always filled to capacity in the biggest auditorium on campus, and there were non-Jeffersonians who were trying to get into the building to participate. But um, let's close with a few images of uh, Jefferson nursing from her historic photo file. The source for much of this story of the Diploma Nurse Program is from Andrew Shearer's 1982 book, A Commitment to Excellence, A History of the School of Nursing at TJU. At the end of the book, the author ponders about the death of the final surviving graduate of the school. But happily now, that won't happen for many, many ge generations to come. I want to thank you very much for, for listening. Um, we also have a, a really cool oral history project. Um, we've gotten a number of uh, Oral history is already under our belt, and we'd like to hear from all of you. So please contact Kelsey Dinekirken. Her email is at the bottom. And um, we can connect you and make sure that your record is recorded with us. And uh, if you have any more questions or complaints or corrections, which I'm sure I, I'm liable for, uh, please contact me by my email. I'd love to speak with you. And finally, I guess we're going to do the Q&A now. Open it up. I did have one note that the tapes are available until 1975. Excellent. That will go in the file, and now I don't have to be too undecisive. Great. Thank you. Everyone in the minute to collect your thoughts and write a question. You can type in your questions on the right hand side in the question box. We want Kelsey's information again, so I will go back to that slide. And again, everyone will receive a recording of this webinar and it will be posted on the website. All right, Michelangelo. <laughs> How many Jeff nurses are still alive? That's a great question. I'm going to pass that off to our uh, alumni relations people. We think, uh, according to our records, there are about 9,100. So, and we'll have a new graduating class coming up here soon in May uh, that'll add to that. But we think 9,100, um, we, we believe, are still living. Wow. Cool. Someone says wow. <laughs> wow, indeed. All right, let's see. So when did the Alumni Association officially begin? That's a great question. I'm going to have to get back to you on that. That is really a good question. Do we know what the highest rank attained by a Jeff nurse was in the service? Um, Madeline Olam was. She was a, yeah, Madeline Olam, I think, was a lieutenant colonel. I believe that mm -hmm. was, and um, well deserved, I think. Beth Ann, do you want to give us a little insight of where the JCN is going today? 
Well, the Jefferson College of Nursing is, is on the move. So uh, as you may have read or heard, uh, we were designated as the National League for Nursing Center of Excellence in Nursing Education in 2015. Um, our programs are ranked in the top 100 in U.S. News and World Report. Um, we continue to grow our programs to meet the national need and also what the national reports, including the future of nursing, um, are really looking for. So our master's programs are now being offered as masters of science in nursing, as well as students can complete a post BSN to DNP, the doctor of nursing practice, in our nurse practitioner tracks, as well as our nurse anesthesia program. We also have our community systems administration program and nursing informatics that students can complete as a master's student or a doctoral student. As, as you may have been reading in the press, uh, Jefferson has recently merged with Abington Hospital and Abington Health, and we will be writing a proposal to the State Board of Nursing to open a BSN program at the Abington Dixon campus in Willow Grove. Uh, if all goes well, we will seat the first class in the fall of 2017. Uh, hot off the press, the ink dried on the Aria Health merger within the last week or two. Uh, Aria also has a diploma nursing program. Some of you may know it, uh, the Frankfurt Hospital program which is, uh, I think that opened in 1904, and the Abington Diploma Nursing Program opened in 1911. Um, so we have a lot of history now here at Jefferson. Um, you may have also read about the letter of due diligence with Philadelphia University, another opportunity for our College of Nursing. So there's a lot going on. Uh, thanks to the visionary leadership of our president, uh, Stephen Clasco. Are there any other questions? We have Peggy Malone who joined us this evening, and she, let's see, she retired as a captain in the United States Navy. Uh, she's commanding officer of the Naval Hospital in Charleston, South Carolina. So that's Peggy Malone Allard, uh, Lieutenant, and then Peggy Malone Allard is Lieutenant Colonel in 05. Cool. Wonderful. We're taking all this down. We're adding this to our our archives. And don't be shy about contacting uh, Kelsey. Um, she's done interviews over the phone as well. So if you're you're remote, um, we can record your story. And and I'm just going to reiterate. I, we really encourage you to. There's the, the histories that you can see there, but they're really um, both interesting and entertaining. Um, and I believe the oldest history we have is from one of our graduates from actually 1940, um, who, whose sister um, re recorded the oral history on, on behalf of um, her sister. So they, they were competing. Her, her sister was a Jeff grad, and she herself was a Temple grad. And there, apparently back then there was a lot of competition um, between Jefferson and Temple. You have one more question. Transcultural nursing, is it something that is a consideration in the future? The term transcultural nursing, and again, you can write in if I'm going down the wrong path. Um, we have a, a focus on um, cultural competency 
um, in today's both nursing curriculum as well as uh, medicine and the health professions. So yes, that's a cultural competency, transcultural nursing is a, the focus uh, in our curriculum. I think that's all the questions we have right now. As you can see on the last slide, we have a lot of interesting and engaging events that will be coming up for the rest of the year. I'm going to put up a poll to just see if any of you are interested in any of those upcoming events, and then maybe it'll encourage you to attend some more. And I'd, I'd really encourage you, if you could, can come on March the 9th uh, to our event uh, at Maggiano's in King of Prussia. We will be featuring an alumni panel discussion, uh, which the panel will feature uh, Rich Webster, who's the president of Thomas Jefferson University Hospital, Jefferson alumni. He will uh, have the practice perspective. We will have Tamara Bonzanto, a more recent graduate of 2010, who serves in the uh, U.S. House uh, Appropriations. She'll be talking to us from a policy perspective. And then we'll have Dr. Lisa Plowfield as our uh, Jefferson alumni who will talk to us about education. So 125 years from tradition to tomorrow, looking back and leading forward. So we hope if you can make it, um, we would love to see you on March 9th and at all the events. Um, that will be celebrating 125 years for the Jefferson College of Nursing. And we have one more question, if you could explain what Visiting Scholar Day is. Visiting Scholar Day is a day we've been having on campus um, for probably more than 15 years, where we invite a nationally and or internationally renowned scholar to campus, and they come usually in the morning and spend some time with our faculty and students. Then we have a luncheon, and then in the afternoon the scholar gives a presentation, um, typically from 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock. And this year we are thrilled um, to have Dr. Diana Mason, uh, who is the past president of the American Academy of Nursing, as our, as our speaker. So it looks like there's a lot of interest in our, our events, um, our the Diploma Nursing Reunion Luncheon on May the 7th. Please come to the day at the zoo on the 11th, our visiting scholar in September. And then not to be missed is our culminating alumni gala on November the 5th, which will be held here on campus at Thomas Jefferson University. And so again, on behalf of Dr. Clasco, the Office of Institutional Advancement, Michelangelo, University Archivist Extraordinaire, Oops. Oops. Um, and everyone at the Jefferson College of Nursing, we really appreciate you joining us this evening, and we hope to see you, hear from you, and hear all your stories about your time at Jefferson. So thank you, and have a good night.